You are listening to the Global CTE Podcast with your host, Sylvester Chisholm. Welcome, my friend, to another episode of the Global CTE Podcast. I am your host, Sylvester Chisholm. This is the place where we like to wrap a blanket of goodwill around the career tech education community, and I interview the best, the brightest, the movers, the shakers, the innovators. Today is no different. I have my good friend, Samantha Lori Carroll on the show. Now, let me tell you about Samantha. Samantha is the executive director and co-founder of the Show Me the World Project, a nonprofit dedicated to providing life-changing educational opportunities to students from under-resourced communities at home and abroad. Under her leadership, the project has grown to support over 150 students and 24 educators across eight schools. Samantha has led the evolution of the Show Me the World project into a comprehensive program that integrates science, leadership, cultural immersion, and entrepreneurship. Previously, she has worked as a special education teacher at Vashon High School, as well as the Dean of Students there. In 2015, she was named the St. Louis Public Schools Special Education Teacher of the Year. She's also a Teach for America St. Louis alum and previously served as the Managing Director of Alumni Network Leadership for TFA Metro Atlanta. Samantha champions the philosophy that every student deserves a global classroom transforming not just educational outcomes, but lives. Samantha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sylvester. What a kind and awesome introduction. I appreciate that. I did oh. notice one thing, though. You you forgot one part What's in that? there. <laughs> okay, what's that? You forgot that um, Sylvester Chisholm is my co-founder of Show Me the World Project, <laughs> along with okay. my Atua Pong. But um, <laughs> yes, you forgot to say that. So thank you for all of your hard work on the Show Me the World Project as well. Oh, man. Thank, yeah, thank, thank you for saying that. Um, yes, to everyone listening. Yes, I am a co-founder with Samantha and Dr. Buema Aduapong, who works on all the science and um, really has grown that portion. But I'm excited to talk to you from the lens of like as the host of of the CTE podcast, right? From this standpoint that the work you're leading, the work that is happening at Show Me the World, I think honestly is just one of the most innovative things that I've I've seen across the board in terms of the the student engagement, uh the career exploration, the career connection, you know, the work based learn all the stuff. It's like it has all of it in there. So I'm I'm here today to pull out the insights from you, Miss Lori Carroll. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. I'm excited. Yeah. I, I have been a fan of your podcast um and just all the amazing people that you are interviewing. Everybody drops so much knowledge and gems. So um, I'm really proud of you uh, nice. for, you know, creating this platform. And it's been an honor to learn from so many guests that you've had in the past. Outstanding. Outstanding. Okay. So now that we got that out the way, uh, what's, what's your origin story? Literally, how do you get here? How did I get here? Okay. So I am a native of Lansing, Michigan. I went off to college and I studied psychology. My father was a teacher. And, you know, I was like, mm, I'm not exactly sure what career I want to have, but like teaching's not it, right? Mm -mm, my dad's a teacher and like he has to deal with a lot. I don't know. I mean, he loves it, but yeah. So um, I end up getting to my senior year and, um, you know, I knew I wanted to like study psychology deeper, but I just didn't know what program I wanted to get into yet. So I ended up um, learning about Teach for America and I applied to Teach for America and I was like, it's a two year commitment. You know, like I know a thing or two about teaching because my dad is a teacher um, and I love like helping people. I love teaching. I love learning. And so it's like, yeah, I can go do that for two years and then go pursue, 
you know, my psychology master's degree. So I end up um, getting into Teach for America and moving to St. Louis after college and absolutely fell in love with teaching. You know, classic <laughs> story. Like I've seen my parent do it. I don't want to do it, but here I am. Um, so I absolutely fell in love with teaching students, the community, you know, like I, that was my first time in St. Louis and um, just really absolutely enjoyed my coworkers, the mission of the school, the history of the school, and just felt honored to be a part of it. So um, I ended up becoming a special education teacher and I taught for eight years and got a couple of master's degrees just to like you know, continue um, trying to get great for kids because that's who I was there for, for sure. And um, and yeah, and so then I, uh, I ended up becoming Dean of Students and just, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm locked into education. Yep, this, this is definitely my career path. And so I've been able to work through, you know, work for several nonprofit organizations along the way. And then, um, you know, eventually start my own uh, that I co-founded with you in Boima. So I would just say that here I am. Uh, I joined Teach for America in 2008 and became a teacher. And I am still loving it and super passionate about being involved in education and education equity. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's a, that's a really good story. I think there's so many people, like you said, that we see our parents do something and you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But you don't realize this this whole time you've been learning <laughs> by osmosis on on how to do something, to do this thing. Um, I'm curious, the psychology part, how does that show up today in your leadership? Like as mm -hmm. as in. In your role, like as an education nonprofit leader, like how does that psychology piece show up today? Yeah, so it's interesting. I was a college athlete. And so when I first moved to St. Louis, I don't know if you know this, but I was like, I'm going to make sports psychology, you know, connection. So mm -hmm. I actually went in, um, and shadowed and and spoke with the sports psychologist for the Cardinals and the Rams at the time and planned to, you know, volunteer and just learn a bit. And then, of course, I got so busy with teaching that that just fell off. Um, but I, I think I always love just the study of the mind and the study of human behavior um, and had a great education um, at Earlham College of just a variety of psychology courses and so I, this is a question that I actually think about a lot um mm -hmm. in terms of how this shows up for me and so I think I definitely like pay attention to human behavior I like to you know read articles listen to podcasts and whatnot just about the psychology behind you know people interactions teams and so um I think that I've been able also to make a lot of connections around just um, the psychology of being a part of a basketball team, you know, for so long and how that shows up in my leadership of just really valuing a team, right? Knowing that you can't do anything alone. You have to have contributions and strengths of many individuals um, to move forward and to move fast. And so I... I, they, I could go on and on, but psychology has shown up in so many ways, especially with working with students and watching their development and how you interact with them and how, you know, you your words can be used, you know, as an empowering tool or a weapon of destruction. So mm -hmm. um, I think there are actually a lot of connections there where ultimately I was studying psychology but um, I was a nonprofit minor, a uh, nonprofit management minor. And yeah. Are you serious? I did not know that. See, I knew that's why I wanted to do this because I'm like, we we talk so much about show me and education and schools and our students and educators. But really, are you serious? I did I had no idea. <laughs> yes. 
Wow. <laughs> and now it's a full circle moment. And there's definitely psychology utilized every single day. Um, so yeah. Um, it's been mm. it's great to know that I that that I studied something in psychology in uh sorry, in college that has been very applicable to my career, even though my career has not specifically been in psychology in the way that I thought that it would be. Right. Yeah, that's 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 some deep insights there. Um and I it makes a lot of sense to me as one of the superpowers that I see from working with you is your ability to to galvanize, to bring people together to work on hard problems. Like you 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 excel in that space as a as a leader of of teams and and creating teams. So with that said and understanding that it takes a village to to make something happen and to solve a problem, let's go to the early days. Take me back to 2012, how the founding story of the Show Me Costa Rica project, the predecessor to the Show Me the World project. Take me there. Yeah, so before we get into that, I have to build a little context just about my upbringing also. So I grew up in a smaller town of Lansing, Michigan. It is the capital, though, of Michigan, not Detroit. And um, and so I um, grew up in a Jewish family, and it was always the value of my parents, which stemmed from my grandparents, um, to go to school, to build friendships and engage with people who don't look like you. So mm -hmm. for, for most of my schooling, I was the minority, um, within my school, um, as a white Jewish woman. So I, um, you know, like the high school I went to was a predominantly black high school and, um, in middle school, I mean, we just, we just had a ton of diversity, honestly. And so I, when you think about the psychology, you know, you go back to that. It's like, I've been engaging with people from all different walks of life, like almost my whole life, you know? Yeah. Almost my whole, I should say my whole life now at this point. And so, um, I'm super grateful for that because I just, um, you know, it really helped shape me just to have an understanding for different people and not be scared to interact with different people. Like, you know, I love meeting new people, interacting with them, you know, learning from them. And so I share this context because, um, you know, I didn't, I went to a, a high school in the city. I had never went to like a very suburban um, schooling system or anything like that. And so in 2012, um, I had the opportunity to volunteer for this phenomenal um, nonprofit organization in St. Louis called Cultural Leadership. And it was uh, the focus was for black and Jewish high school students to learn about each other, learn about education equity, learn about the isms and work together toward, you know, uh, towards social justice issues um, and building coalitions to work together. So you can see the context I just shared with you. You're like, yeah. oh, yeah. I, when I came across that, I was like, I have to be involved in this. Right. So um, there was a, a school swap aspect. And so a few of my students at Vishan and I went over um, to one of the most affluent high schools in St. Louis, Clayton High School, and we got to shadow them for the day. And mind you, that previous context, this was my first time in a very suburban you know, school setting like this. So I was just as shocked and appalled as they were. I mean, I know I study education, so I understand, but to be immersed you know, that was my first time as well. So needless to say, our students from Vishan and myself, we were looking at all the opportunities that were offered to the students at Clayton versus the opportunities at Vishan. And, um, you know, so at the end of the day, I mean, the kids were able to speak with the principal and just came with just phenomenal observations and questions and were super curious. And so that was a pivotal moment um, right there. And so what happened was the students, one of the opportunities that they saw that they were just blown away by, there was an advertisement in the cafeteria that said, sign up for international educational trip. And they were like, Miss Lurie, what? This, is, this would be like a dream for us. You know, how come they get the opportunity, but we don't? 
Um, so obviously as a teacher, that's like a hard question to answer. Like, you're right. You deserve that. Um, and so, yeah, so it was really the kids who advocated after having that experience and kept, and I was teaching biology at the time. So like, Miss Laurie, come on, let's do it. How can we do this? We want to do it. Um, so in that moment, I was like, you're right. Let, okay, let's try. In the back of our mind, I'm like, I have no idea how this is going to happen, but we'll try our best. Um, so that was really the birth of Show Me Costa Rica project, which was the school project um, original name before we turned into a nonprofit organization. And we decided to go to Costa Rica because I was teaching biology. And mind you, like Vashon High School is extremely historic, right? You have family that um, is part of that Vashon history that goes way back. And so this would be the very first student group to travel internationally in over 90 year, you know, in over a 90 year history. So it was like, Whoo, OK, let's do this. The kids want this. Let's bring the community together. And so in that first year, we were we were able to raise over twenty five thousand dollars to um, to support 10 students from Bashan High School and becoming first time international travelers. And that was the beginning of what is today show the show me the world project wow and that was i know we have a special day um that first day that you touched down in costa rica with that first group of students you want to share about that march 16th that was a that was the first day right yep yeah so yep so march march 16th 2013 that was wow. the day. And so, so and so that is where we get show me the world day. Show me the world mm -hmm. day, March 16th. And that's the day that we now celebrate that first group from 2012, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it started in 2012, but they traveled in 2013. 2013. So 2012, 2013 school year. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's 11 that's, years ago when they traveled. That's so special. Um, wow. I I want to ask I want to ask you uh, during that during that time. Did you ever have any doubt that it would not come to pass that this experience would happen for these students? No, I didn't. I think I was nervous about just trying looking at the, the time frame and how we would figure it out. But like when you have students who you adore, believe in, like I just, like I said, I was trying to touch my heart in so many ways and just all the students, that's why you show up every day, right? That's why you do what you do. And so, you know, to have students really advocate and just look me in my eyes and say like, we deserve this opportunity. That was the motivation right there. So knowing that they believed in it, that they wanted it, their parents, the community, I think in the back of my mind, I was like, I don't know how exactly we'll figure this all out, but um, this is a powerful coalition and we will figure it out. How? Okay. So give me some tactical things because I know someone is listening and they're thinking like, man, I have this big idea that could transform my school system or mm -hmm. to do something out of the box with my students that's never been done before. But, you know, what if the district doesn't support me or, you know, how do I get buy-in from other teachers or stakeholders? Can you share any tangible strategies in up uh, in your approach um that you you feel like help to bring this to life yeah sure so first of all you just have to be bold enough to start right like at the beginning this like i've mentioned this was the first international trip opportunity in a, over 90 school year history, right? So you just have to be bold enough to start. That's the first thing. Um, I think the second thing is just that, um, 
you can't do it alone. You can't do things alone. So you might have an idea right now, but get out in your community, connect with people, make sure that um, your idea, you know, you discuss your idea with other people, get their input on it, um, or just make sure that there's a real problem to be solved, right? Because a lot of times we have ideas, um, but what problem is that idea solving? So make sure that you identify that um, because that's going to make it a lot easier to talk to people about it and kind of like explain your case and your solution and whatnot. Um, and so I think also my last like tangible idea was like, even take a piece of paper, a whiteboard. I love whiteboards. Um, and just write out all of the people that are already in your network and in your community that you want to reach out to, to brainstorm with, to share their idea with, um, just to get some input, some feedback, and to start to get some some buy-in and, and build that network and, and team around you. Because I can tell you this right now, this Show Me the World project would not be what it is today without so many phenomenal people contributing to it. So make sure that you're bringing people into the loop because you cannot do it alone. Yeah, that's powerful. Uh, and I, I think that's, yeah, you really speak to like the belief system you have to have. And then also the spirit of collaboration, um, which I think is such a powerful thing. So I know, I know someone listening is like, okay, that's great. Oh, you're taking, students on the on a trip talk to me like let's get to the nitty-gritty the educational experiences like talk to me about the ed some of the educational outcomes that um that you've seen with your students absolutely so obviously when when you introduced it like there's kind of um a lot of pieces going on in Show Me the World project. <laughs> um, but we have found the power in bringing together entrepreneurship, STEM learning, and global competency development and, um, and travel. And so what we are studying and what we have seen is this non-cognitive skill development, durable skill development. Thank you, Thank you for saying um, durable skills. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we are looking at that. So for those of you who don't know, um, which I know Sylvester, you know, has talked about it a lot, but collaboration, communication, teamwork, punctuality, right? And so the list goes on and on. And so we um are basically studying this throughout these different um experiences that students are having. So through our entrepreneurship piece, students are learning the whole farm to cup coffee process. They are learning how to package, sell, roast coffee, sort coffee. They're learning the whole system of where it comes through and the whole cycle um, of a coffee bean, um, starting with a coffee plant. So they are learning so many skills there. And then they're learning how to market, sell, package, um, pitch. <laughs> all of the great show me the world coffee that they're learning about. And so that is a big teaching tool, but it, and it's also a funding tool um, as well for their first international trip. And so we've had found a lot of power in students just having that ownership and, um, you know, not necessarily having their hand out, but uh, acquiring these workforce development skills, these durable skills that not only will help them achieve this major milestone in their life of becoming first-time international travelers, but also being able to take all of these skills and apply it to their future moving forward. So we have seen so many students um, between our entrepreneurship training, between our STEM learning, where they get the chance to um, study the rainforest, the ecosystems, using our legal le uh, local resources, in addition to Washington University, um, shout out to Dr. Boima Aduapong, who leads that part. And so we have just seen a ton, even before students go on a trip, um, they're learning so much from STEM and entrepreneurship learning in our workshops that's really equipping them um, for college and career readiness. And it's just the results. You know, I know you asked about the outcomes, but the results are tremendous. 
Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing more students go off to college, more students studying abroad in college, which is also um, a big deal because they already have a passport. So right. um, they feel more confident, you know, to take those experiences on. We're seeing GPA increases. We're seeing science score, um, Missouri State sky, uh, science scores increase. And so, um, yeah, we're just seeing overall confidence and um, really this like global leader development that is yeah. going to pay off huge dividends in their future. Yeah, I think um thank you for sharing that and in the way I love the way that you you lifted up the the skills and the connection to you know to the to the travel and workshops. I just say like seeing it firsthand and being on a plane with someone, this is like these our young leaders, and this is the first time they've ever traveled on an airplane, first time international, first time out the country or in the rainforest or hiking a volcano. Like it is first time in the ocean. Like I think it's man, it is just such a, a wonderful experience like as an adult to be a part of like, and I know I, we continue to hear that feedback from the educators who, um, you know, who, who we work with at the different schools, but like, give me a student perspective. Give me a student perspective, someone who, uh, who you really feel like the show me the world project has had a deep impact on their life. Yeah, well, first of all, there's so many stories, um, <laughs> so many stories. And, you know, Sylvester, before we go into that, I'm just thinking uh, when you were talking about kids experiencing things for the first time, I, I just had this like flash of all these stories in my head of just uh -huh. like first time experiences. Like, yes, I remember we were uh, snorkeling in the ocean and the first time we got in there and one of our students tasted the salt and he said, it tastes like seasoning salt. <laughs> <laughs> um, <and so. laughs> yeah, I know it's it's so it's like so many moments, <laughs> random moments like that, or like being on the you know on the uh the coffee forms or the chocolate forms, just like seeing these things uh firsthand. I uh mm -hmm. I'm thinking you making me cool. think your school's right, you're making me think about an experience where hiking uh in the rainforest and our tour guide Walter points out uh a vanilla plant and and one of the the young leaders that was standing next to me was just over the moon about it because their favorite ice cream was vanilla ice cream and and to see to make that connection to something you eat at home that you buy at the grocery store, but then connect it in such a deep way to see the van a vanilla plant in its natural environment and to make that connection. That was really, I don't know. I found that to be a very special moment to, for me to be like, wow, like look how you can make these connections to your favorite ice cream. Yes. Here in the rainforest. Just, yeah. So many powerful, so many powerful stories are, you know, students who get there, I remember like one kid was just like, I feel at peace. Like my nervous system feels at peace being here. And, um, you know, just, whoo, I, I remember my first international trip. Um, I was mm -hmm. able to study abroad for a month in college. I went to Senegal, Africa. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate, you know, about um, supporting students and gaining this early exposure as well. And I still remember as soon as we got off the plane, my best friend and I went together. I remember the smell. I remember we saw this little mini shell gas station. Like there was like a, a horse kind of like tied up uh, to a rope like on there while somebody was running into the gas station. And my mind was <laughs> blown. Like there's this whole other world out here that I have never experienced. And so I think that we have so many of those moments, you know, and every student does because journaling is such a big part 
of our experience and like to kick off journaling, um, you know, on our first day of our trips and in the program, I always go back to my journal from Senegal and I read some of those passages and remind students like, I don't remember this. If I had not written this, I wouldn't remember this. So um, that's so key. But I think to answer your question, um, you know, we have uh, a staff member now who's an alum of the very first program. So, you know, March 16th is super significant for us. We, it is about raising money um, for the next group of students to carry on this legacy that 10 students from Bashan High School, right, advocated for. And, um, and so of course we're here to fundraise money, but we're also here to celebrate like that first group. We're here to celebrate the growth of the organization, the history, um, and all that we've been able to accomplish as a collective community, um, over the last 11 years. And so I bring that student up because what a full circle moment to have her as she went on her very first trip, March 16th, 2013, um, and since then, she has become a first generation high school and college graduate. Mm. She uh, went and studied abroad and went back to Costa Rica in high or, I'm sorry, in college and um, for a longer period of time and has traveled to two more countries since then. And so, um, you know, now she went off to become a teacher, a Teach for America teacher, actually. <laughs> so. Mm. She went to um, become a middle school math teacher um, for several years, and uh, and now she's still teaching and helping lead the next generation of Show Me the World leaders. So I just think that is just so special, um, all that she's been able to accomplish, all her stories that she's able to share and, you know, connect it back to her experience um, in Show Me Costa Rica project at the time to really empower um, this next group, this next group and next generation of students and global citizens and leaders. Yeah, I think that's that's so powerful, like um, to see the, 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 the young people who come back, right? Who want to support and pay it forward for the next group of students as mentors. Uh, and I think that speaks to a lot to how transformative the experience was for them with the workshops, the the skill development, the international travel, and to see um, the support that they received in that way. But then also I know, uh, talk to me, bring it back to some of the impact to what you're seeing, like is attendance improved, like grades improved, like any feedback there? Oh yeah, um, absolutely. So we um, track GPAs um, and set goals around it. So, you know, at the beginning of the year, they average up as a group what their uh, what their group GPA is and that every marking period, every semester and whatnot, um, constantly reaching for the, the new goal that they set. And so, I mean, we've had, because of that, we've had so many, and of course it's connected to their participation in the project and going on the trip. We've had so many students make huge gains. I mean, I'm talking like students coming in with a one point GPA and uh, we have this thing called a 4.0 club. So if you make a 4.0, then you get additional money towards your trip. And so, um, yeah, so we've had students come in with 1.8s, 2.0s and achieve a 4.0 and have a 3.8 or above for the rest of their high school career, yeah. um, which is obviously trajectory changing um in terms of what what happens after that so um yes huge gpa gains we do not require students to come in with a certain gpa but obviously they have to be willing to dedicate themselves to the whole program um and really buy in and they have to maintain a 3.0 gpa or higher um to remain as a participant of course mm -hmm. we're supporting them along the way with that um, and then our biology scores, um, when students are able, I mean, that's just the reality. Experiential learning is amazing. And when you walk through a rainforest and 
you are actually seeing like an epiphyte on a tree in a, you know, different symbiotic relationships. Here's mutual, here's an example, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, um, you know, and you're able to see the vanilla beans and you're able to see photosynthesis in action and how the whole food ecosystem and the food webs work together and identify, oh, those are producers, those are consumers. It, it just takes your understanding to a whole nother level. And, um, and we are seeing the results of students studying beforehand, going on the trip, and then how they perform um, mm -hmm. after that, because their level of understanding is so different when you're walking through a very rich country or very, very rich in biodiversity. Um, that is what Costa Rica is very rich in biodiversity. So it's just different than reading a textbook and watching videos. So we're seeing the tremendous results of experiential learning. I love it. And talk to me about the, I want to hear a little, make the, the CTE connection back with the coffee and seeing the durable skills, the students selling at the farmer's market, like, like, what do you, I don't know, anything you want to talk about in, from that phase of it? Yeah. So actually we just um, gave students a survey recently. And so it was even interesting to see their direct perspective, obviously as leaders and educators in the group, we're seeing kids like come to the first day, you know, of the farmer's market because they have to be there at their participation, you know, for their participation in the project. And they are very shy and reserved. <laughs> and they're like, I don't know, but there's all these people here. I don't know what's going on. Like, I'm scared. I'm nervous. I don't like to talk to strangers. So a lot of times that's how that first experience is, um, you know, but they're also like, but I'm committed to this project. I want to go on this trip. I want to learn these skills. So I'm going to learn. And they continue to show up and learn um, each and every farmer's market. And so, you know, looking back at looking at this recent data, you know, the survey, it's like students are like, I'm so grateful to have the experience of the farmer's market because I'm so confident now in speaking to strangers and giving my pitch and like letting mm -hmm. people know that this is an awesome product. And I can explain the difference between light, medium and dark roast. And <laughs> I can explain the origin and the, you know, the tasting notes also of the coffee. And I'm so confident and people are buying it and it's helping fund mm. my trip. Um, and so I just think that we see the, this huge, right, increase in terms of confidence and they're calling out, I'm learning how to collaborate better. I'm learning how to communicate with people um, who don't look like me, who have a completely different walk of life than me, right? And my own classmates. So it has been extremely powerful in seeing them um, develop those entrepreneurial skills. And um, I would say there's also one student that shared, she said, um, by coming out to the farmer's market, being prepared every day, you know, to sell and learning how to be prepared, selling and being rejected at times, right? Mm -hmm. Has taught me a lot of lessons as well about being a businesswoman and being an entrepreneur and how I apply that to my life as a student. And so she said, mm -hmm. you know what? Now I know it's okay. Like not everybody's going to buy it, but I'm not going to back down. I'm going to keep getting out there. I'm going to yeah. keep selling. I'm going to keep preparing. And, um, she related that to receiving a bad grade on a test and not accepting that and instead asking like, hey, can I redo this and let me go study harder and let me take the test again instead of feeling rejection and sorry for herself. So I thought that was super powerful. Yeah, yeah no, that resilience, that's um, to keep, keep fighting through and pushing through, uh, focusing on the solution. That's so powerful. Now, March 16th. I think. Go, 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 Sorry, go. Talk to one, I think, and I think the key thing is like our students come with resilience. They come mm -hmm. with resilience from so many different experiences. They're in high school now. And so I think that this experience affirms that in ways. It gives them the opportunity to demonstrate and look at that in a different way. 
um, and looking at how that um, characteristic can play out um, just in a different way in terms of like, you know, entrepreneurship and setting long-term goals. I love that you said that to see how maybe something that naturally had, they've had to build up that resilience, how it can be leveraged as a phenomenal asset toward achieving goals or redirected to other things where they can have a, a positive impact. Yeah, I like that. That's that, and that's Perfect. and that's so true. You're right. You see that, you see that time and time again through uh, through a, a lot of the the young leaders we have in the program. Which brings me to March sixteenth. Here we go. Here we go. Celebrating. Uh, this is the eleventh year, March sixteenth, and you have a big announcement. I know. I wanted to have you on the platform to share about Show Me the World Day, that this one is has been made extra special, you said, by mm -hmm. an anonymous donor, and I'll let you take it from there. Yes, so we have received a $15,000 match grant cool. um, from this special donor. And so for those of you who don't know what a match grant means, that means that for every dollar donated, a dollar will be matched. So if you donate $10, that means it's like $20, right? If you donate $100, it'll be like $200. And so we are super excited because it is our goal to raise $30,000 um, this Show Me the World Day because we are going, in the first time in history, right, we are going to be actually serving 50 and, and supporting 50 more students um, in a calendar year than we have in the past. And so we are super excited about that. And we, um, yeah, so we we are super grateful for this match grant and it is our goal to essentially raise the $15,000 so the other $15,000 can be matched to reach our goal. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think it's it's a testament to the hard work like I know I'm a part of it, but to see your commitment to excellence, your team building, um, the community around it, all of our educators who have been around from for so many years, committed, Septicia, Jamisha, Anna, Lauren, uh, just so many great, great uh, people giving themselves to this program, to the project. So this, so super grateful for uh to have that 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 anonymous donor who decide they want to remain anonymous in that, but to to help in this way to make this show me the world day special March sixteenth up until that point, um, yes, definitely we we that support is is requested and they can visit show me the world project dot org and hit the donate button. I'll make sure that is linked in the show notes as well. But I know, Samantha, I know someone is listening and is like chomping at the bit like, OK, this is great. And show me the world day. I want to support that, too, and get some coffee. But how do I bring this program to my school? Like what? Like how long is it? Just give me a little short um, explanation on that and then, you know, where they should go if they want to reach out. Yeah, so we are partnering with school districts um, and to essentially bring our coaching and curriculum, um, our whole program, to high schools. And we work in partnership with educators um, at the school to implement the curriculum um, and coach them every step of the way. And uh, we are super excited to be increasing, you know, our number of students and school partnerships. And so you should definitely feel free to reach out. Um, our email address is just contact at showmetheworldproject.org. And we'd love to have a conversation with you to, to see what you're thinking and how we could possibly partner together to support more students. Absolutely. Now, Sam, this is the question I ask everyone this question, and I'm super curious your answer 
um, especially through this global lens and this experiential education lens. What is your vision for the future of career tech education? So my vision is that it just becomes as experiential and applicable as possible. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, through our collaboration, our entrepreneurship piece and really financial literacy, honestly, has become so experiential and applicable that students are locked in, right? So, oh, I get to go on a trip. Yep, I want to learn about how to open a bank account. I want to learn how to budget. I want to learn how to sell the coffee, right? And so um, I think from that experience, I, and, I, and I know that there are a lot of CTE programs that are very experiential and applicable, um, but I think when we can get to that place where we have a variety of pathways that are so experiential, applicable and where students can earn credentials that will um, move them forward at a, a faster rate because they can be doing this in high school. I think that um, that will be a beautiful, a beautiful world and opportunity um, for all of our students to be able to experience things that they're interested in in a very experiential and applicable way. Very well said. Could not have said it better myself. Samantha, Lori, Carol, thank you so much for your time on the show. Um, thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for sharing so much knowledge around how, how you're really like just adding a lot of hope and excitement and fun back into the educational process for our youth and for students. Uh, I think that's, I think that's important. I think it's very important. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't be selfish. Share with a friend or a colleague so that they can receive the same inspiration and knowledge as you. Until the next episode, remember, you don't have to be great to get started, but you have to get started to be great. great. Peace. Thank you for listening to the Global CTE Podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to be the first to know about future episodes.